The functions of language. By the end of this lecture, I'd like you to be able to explain the difference between general communication on the one hand and language on the other. We're also going to have a look at a basic model of communicative acts, and you should be able to explain this. Finally, I'd like you to be able to identify and exemplify some of the basic functions of language. So linguistics is the study of human language. But before we talk about language, let's clarify for ourselves what is communication. Communication is endemic in the animal world. Many species communicate, for instance, bees communicate non-verbally through a set of complex dances that are aligned to the angle of the sun with respect to some kind of pollen source. And when bees find a pollen source, they'll come back to the hive, perform this dance, which communicates a set of complex instructions to the bees so that they can go and find the pollen source. We know that whales, porpoises and dolphins can communicate. Uh, and many of you might already have heard recordings of so-called whale song. Whales and porpoises use sounds for echolocation, for instance, finding each other and finding food in the darkness of the sea. However, they will also seem to use these sounds for communication between groups. There is a documented instance of two pods of whales which were traveling many kilometers apart and which were coincidentally being monitored by two separate groups of marine biologists. At one point, one of the pods of whales began to sing their song, and many hundreds of kilometers away, the other pod of whales changed direction, and a few days later, the two pods met together. This seems to strongly imply that whale song is a form of nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication can also be visual. For instance, peacocks have a complex display of tail feathers, which show that they are ready to mate. There are no words, there are no sentences, but nevertheless, the meaning of the peacock tail seems very clear, at least to other peacocks. Human beings also communicate non-verbally. If you look at this picture, you'll see a young man and two young women. And we can immediately see, even though there are no words in the picture itself, that they are favorably disposed to each other, that their body language indicates that they are relaxed and friendly, and that they are perhaps interested in furthering their relationship. All this is done without words. So communication is any system of transferring information. It could be smoke signals, whale songs, bee dances, chatting, courtship dances, etc. What is important to note, though, is that language seems to be unique to human beings. There doesn't seem to be anything comparable in the animal world. So communication is the transfer of information by a medium, including language, but also including other things. It does not need to be systematic, and it uses general cognitive mechanisms such as association, relevance, contrast, inference, fuzzy logic schema, drives, visualization, and many more. So enough about communication. What then is language? Language is a complex and specialized code. It is unique to human beings. Children seem to learn the language without any explicit teaching. And this contrasts quite sharply with other kinds of knowledge like mathematics or physics. For instance, if you put a young child into a Japanese home, it will acquire Japanese, even though it doesn't need to go to a Japanese school and no one has to sit the child down and tell it exactly how to go about speaking the language. We all know that children seem to suck language out of thin air and learn it all by themselves. In fact, we know that when adults do attempt to correct children, Often, children seem to ignore that advice. If you were to compare this with mathematics, we get a very different picture. If you were to put a child into a home, how likely is it that the child acquires a complex understanding of trigonometry or geometry? Typically, for this kind of knowledge, we need to go to school. This suggests that language is innate. In other words, human beings have a hardwired disposition to learn and acquire language. We use language every moment of every day. We use it to communicate, flirt, save lives, write poetry, philosophize, joke, chat, shout, scream, whisper, and of course, to earn money. Now that we understand the difference between communication and language, we're going to look at a simple model of a communicative event. But before we do that, I would like you to pause the video here and to watch the clip link below, which is about a communicative mishap concerning the Coast Guard and a ship in need of help. Once you've done that, come back and continue with this lecture.
Now that you've watched the Coast Guard clip, let's unpack it and try and work out what is happening. The clip involves a series of communicative interactions which have both a sender and a receiver. The ship sends a distress call which is received by the Coast Guard. Then the Coast Guard responds and in so doing becomes the sender. The nature of the communication is also appropriate to the relationship. So in formal context, you use a formal kind of code and in informal context, you'd use an informal code. Uh, if you've got a close relationship, you'd perhaps encode your message slightly differently than if you had a distant relationship. The information is packaged in a style and in a code. In this particular example, the code is something called Maritime English, which has a particular formulaic style to it. All of this occurs in a shared context, which would typically allow the senders and receivers to understand the broad context of a communicative act. It is actually quite interesting to analyze the Coast Guard clip and try and work out what has gone wrong. So there's a sender and a receiver, but the Coast Guard rookie is not entirely familiar with the nature of the relationship and the information code. So for instance, although the code is officially maritime English, the Coast Guard rookie has mistaken the code and thinks it is standard English. The rookie also has a flawed conception of the relationship and you can see what he has done. He's construed the relationship between the send and receiver to be a fairly close one because you would only ask someone that you were quite close with what they were actually thinking about. I think that we experience this clip as being funny precisely because we all speak a second language or have tried to learn a language along the way. We also have a sense of empathy and recognize how easily this kind of misunderstanding could possibly happen. Let's try this out for ourselves. For each of the following, identify who are the senders, receivers, the relationship, the code, and the context, etc. For instance, the example, shut up, you kids. The sender is probably a parent or a caregiver of some kind. The receiver is clearly addressed to the kids. The code is informal English, and the relationship must be fairly informal or close because you would only say that kind of thing to children that you're quite familiar with. If you just said that kind of thing to someone's kids you met in the supermarket, it might be perceived as being inappropriate to that particular context. The next example, Yanni Blaise Still. The code in this case is Afrikaans. Yanni is the receiver. The relationship could be one of several. It could be a fairly close relationship. It could be one of Yanni's friends telling him to be quiet, or it could be an authority figure also responding to Yanni. It's a little bit difficult to infer the context or the relationship from such a small example. Next example, how's it? How are you? Fine, thanks, and you? Fine, thanks. The word how's it tells us that the senders and receivers are probably South Africans. This is a fairly informal greeting. You probably wouldn't greet your local priest like this, or your teacher, or your doctor. So we can infer that it is an informal conversation where the senders and receivers are probably known to each other. Another example. Successful coniferous plantations occur throughout all the areas of higher rainfall. We immediately recognize this to be a formal English code. The senders and receivers are really not very clear but we can infer that this is probably from a book or perhaps from a academic paper or an encyclopedia. And we can tell this by the word choices. Certainly the sender seems to be an authoritative figure who would know about coniferous plantations and the receiver would be whoever wants to learn about that kind of thing. How about this example? Write an essay in which you argue that Latin should be made the official language of administration in South Africa. The phrase write an essay gives us a clue that this might be from a test, or even a university assignment. The fact that this is an imperative or a command tells us that the sender is an authoritative figure. It would probably be a lecturer or a teacher who has written this assignment up and is giving it to students. So the receivers would probably then be students of some kind. Looking at these examples, we can see a number of functions of language that are happening here. For instance, commands are being given to try and get people to change their behavior. There are greeting sequences to indicate that people are initiating a conversation. There are also informative sentences that try and confer information between the sender and receiver. And this leads us to consider the functions of language. There are a number of functions that we will go through in turn, the phatic function, the informative function, the directive, expressive, poetic, and the metalinguistic functions, each of which we will do in turn. One of my favorite functions of language, because it is 
So underestimated is the phatic function. Phatic language seeks to create or maintain contact. For instance, there are contact makers, words like hi or hello. If I were to ask you, well, what does hi mean? It would actually be quite hard to explain. All it seems to do is indicate that you're friendly and are initiating some kind of a conversation. Look at this following exchange. How's it? How are you? Fine, thanks, and you? Now we could ask what's going on here. And clearly, A is initiating a conversation of some kind. And B responds in a way that suggests that B is open to having that conversation. Look at this phrase, how are you? Does A really care how B is? In fact, we say this all the time. Hi, how are you? And yet very seldom are we really asking the person how they actually are. In fact, if someone were to reply in an honest way, it could get awkward really quickly. Hi, how are you? B answers, well, actually, I'm not that great because I didn't sleep at all last night. The baby was really making a lot of noise. And then the dog started barking and I went outside to investigate. So I really didn't get much sleep. But I did manage to drop off just before seven in the morning. But that meant I overslept and was late for work. So overall, I'm actually not that well. Oh, my word. As if we actually care. That could get really awkward. The key to understanding here is that the phrase, how are you, is not a genuine interest in how someone is. It is purely phatic language that indicates, I'm willing to talk. Are you willing to listen? Here's another example. In this essay, I will discuss blah, blah, blah. Now look at this phrase, in this essay. What is it doing? In some ways, it looks entirely redundant. All you're saying is that this is an essay. But it should be quite clear to the reader that it is an essay because that is what they're reading. So they don't need the phrase in this essay for the sender to tell them that this is an essay. Imagine if you're reading a newspaper and at the beginning of every news article it said, in this newspaper, there is news that America has a new president. That would seem really odd. So the best way to analyze this kind of phrase is as a phatic contact maker. Here are some types of phatic signals. Feedback. These are to maintain contact. For example, mm -hmm. Mm, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've been you've listened to people and they mm -hmm. say yeah mm, yeah a lot. Mm -hmm. In fact, we usually don't mm -hmm. even notice these kinds of sounds mm -hmm. in a normal conversation. However, if you were to record mm -hmm. yourself, you'd realize that they are actually quite common. Mm -hmm. Now, although we don't mm -hmm. often consciously hear these sounds because we tend to make them mm -hmm. subconsciously, if you stop mm -hmm. making them, it can lead to a mm -hmm. communicative problem. Mm -hmm. Try this: the next time you're on the phone and someone's mm -hmm. talking to you. Don't say, mm, yeah, or give those feedback mechanisms. Just be silent. They might talk for a few seconds and afterwards they'll say, hello, hello, are you still there? And that kind of response gives us a clue to what these things are doing. They are telling someone, yes, I am listening to you. Yes, I do care what you say. Another kind of phatic signal is a linker, which shows relationships between ideas. For instance, if you're making an argument in an essay, you might say something like this. First, I intend to show X, Y, Z. Second, I will argue against... A, B, C. And thirdly, I will conclude by considering P, Q, and R. These types of linkers become particularly important at university when you are trying to express yourself through in essays or other written context. Here's another example on the one hand and on the other hand. If X, then Y. This is when you choose to start with one proposition, which if true, entails a second one. Although, whatever, I think Y. These are all examples of linkers, which I hope that you'll be using in your own essay. There are also contact breakers as a type of phatic signal, and these indicate that it is time for a conversation or to come to an end. For instance, if you go on a date and it's not going particularly well, at some point one of the participants might say, well, it's getting late, and we would then understand this to mean that they are intending to leave soon. We also see contact breakers in letters. For instance, you might end off a letter with something like, yours sincerely, yours faithfully, or with love from X, Y, and Z. And if we stop to think about it for a moment, it is amply clear that with love from doesn't mean that someone loves you. Or when you say yours sincerely, it mean, doesn't mean that that person is being particularly sincere. All it indicates is that it is time to close the conversation or close the letter. The next type of function I'd like to look at is the informative function. This is fairly self-explanatory and is the use of language to transmit information. For instance, right now I am using the informative function. Here are some examples from before successful coniferous plantations occurred throughout all the areas of high rainfall. Or I might say that linguistics is a fantastic major to combine with all the other subjects for your degree. Or Rhodes University is one of the very best in the country. All of these impart useful information from myself 
to you. So while the informative function focuses on the content of the message, the expressive function focuses on the thoughts and the feelings of the sender. For instance, if you're walking around barefoot and you stub your toe, you might say, oh, sherbet. Now, clearly, I'm not interested in sherbet. Why am I doing that? Well, I'm trying to express a certain frustration or painful feeling on my part. You might also say, damn, or oh, shoot, if something doesn't quite go your way. Or when you're talking to a significant other, you might say something like, my darling. And in doing so, you'd be trying to express to that person the way you feel about them. The poetic function is a really fun one, and this is verbal patterning for its own sake. It's a curious fact about human cultures that they all use language to express the idea that language is beautiful in its own right, either through song or poetry or even just written prose. Here's an example from Jack Parrow, and you'll see what he does is mixes up Afrikaans and English. He uses rhyme and rhythm to create an effect that is really quite pleasing. Yes, o nis, ek kom met rau beats. Jy leen wacht, ek gaan soek iets. Jy is ice tea, ek's witblik. Jy is light beer, ek's spirit. Jy is die ou met die new flesh look. Ek's die ou met die pep stores broek. Here's another example of the poetic function in action. In this case, these are just words that are written in an interesting set of fonts and in a particular shape. It is not telling us anything informative. It's not expressing the feeling of the speaker. It's not establishing any kind of communication. It is beautiful and significant purely for its own sake. And that is the heart of the poetic function of language. Let's look at the directive function, which attempts to influence the behavior or the attitudes of others. The most obvious use of the directive function is when you give commands or requests. For instance, please close the door. My papers are all blowing away. You can see from the sentences that the intention of the speaker is trying to influence the behavior of the hearers, insofar as the speaker is trying to get the hearers to close the door. Peter, stop hitting your sister on the head. This is another example of a direct imperative or a command. Here's perhaps a more subtle version. Peter, how would you like it if I hit you with that cricket bat? In this example, there is no obvious directive or a command, but the speaker invites Peter to consider an event that might be particularly disagreeable to him in an attempt to get Peter to empathize with his sister and stop hitting her on the head. This is an example of a disguised directive. A disguised directive seeks to change the behavior of somebody, but as the name implies, it is often disguised in another function of language. For instance, Let's imagine you work for a marketing company, trying to get people to fly on a particular airline. You could use a command or an imperative in the directive function, for instance, fly Emirates Airlines. This tells the hearer directly what you want them to do. You could also disguise your attempt to get people to fly on the airline by utilizing the informative function. For instance, you could say Emirates Airlines gets you there in comfort for less. This lets you know some information about the airlines but we can recognize that the aim of the sentence is to try to get the person to fly on that particular airline. Similarly, you could use an imperative to ask people to directly vote for a particular political party, or you could do it more subtly using a disguise directive that attempts to change people's behavior and get them to vote for your party, but without telling them in such a blunt way. For instance, you might say, the ABC party promises high paying jobs to all those who vote for us. A lot of advertising involves disguised directives. It would be eminently unwise in a deodorant advert to say something like, you smell bad, use deodorant. But that is at the heart of every deodorant advert. And that is why advertising companies go to such lengths to come up with interesting ways to sell deodorant using disguised directives. For instance, musk deodorant makes you irresistible. I submit to you that you would much rather buy musk deodorant to make you irresistible than if someone told you you better use deodorant because you smell. These disguised directives also show us something else about these functions of language, and that is that a particular sentence or utterance could fulfill multiple functions all at once. So if you're asked to identify the functions that work in a particular extract of language, the answer could be any one of them or several of them acting together. In fact, good writers, good poets, good lyricists, and 
Good students make their language interesting by simultaneously using multiple functions of language in interesting ways. Finally, we come to the metalingual function of language. And this is language about other language. And we see a lot of this in linguistics because it is in the nature of linguistics that we are studying language. So when we're talking about linguistics, we're actually using language about language. Here's an example. You might say something like, how do you say this in Sustitu? Or what do you mean by the term function? You could also use language just to describe what you see on a page. For instance, you could say, the sentence structure of this text is very complicated. Where you will often run into this kind of metalingual function is when you write tests and essays, and when these are marked, you might get these kinds of comments back on your essay. Of course, if you do find them on your essay, they are probably also disguised directives because the lecturer wants you to improve your essay writing skills and to do well in the course. And so each comment, although it might be phrased as a question, is actually a suggestion that you revise that particular bit. To summarize, we have contrasted language and communication. Language is a highly specific communication type that has structure that is unique to human language, whereas communication is a general ability that is common to many species. A model of language shows that language involves senders and receivers sending ideas in a particular code within a shared context. And finally, we looked at a variety of functions of language which together combine to produce the richness of meaning that we use to interact with each other.